from Cross Country Magazine, and um, Ed's off today, so it's my turn to do the the, the pilot chat. Um, it's my great pleasure to chat with Seb Ospina today. Seb's written a fantastic article on um, kind of an insider's guide to flying in the Calca Valley in our travel guide, which you can see to the side of me. So he's going to talk a bit about that, and he's going to talk about um, flying to the summit of Mont Blanc and lots more. So let's get him on. Oh, and before we do, just uh, this whole idea came from um, Daniel Crespo's fantastic um, Facebook Live cast on Oyo Volador. So uh, yeah, they're brilliant. Check them out. I mean, to be honest, they're in Spanish. All I got was loads of excitement and blah, 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 blah. But uh, yeah, they, they look really good. Anyway, let's bring on Seb now. Seb is in Interlaken uh, in Switzerland uh, with a map behind his head. Hello, Seb. Hello, guys. How are you? <laughs> so what did you just have for lunch? Uh, I'm about to have some zucchini, stuffed zucchini with some lovely couscous and tomato and, and cheese. Very nice. Yeah. So, so you're over there. You've, you've been in Switzerland for a month. You're um, a tandem pilot, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been in Switzerland for a month uh, now, but well, uh, I haven't managed to work too much in the last couple of weeks. So is it like, uh, I mean, we're not going to mention the C word. If you mention the C word, you have to drink a sip of tea. Okay, that's the okay, game. Okay, I got my tea ready. C word, um, but I guess yeah. So how like w what are you doing that you're kind of enjoying at the moment other than flying, given the situation as it's known? Given the situation with the C word, um, I have to say uh, this is probably one of the best places to wait for for it to go away. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a lot of nature around, and it's very quiet at the moment. And at the moment, we have good weather, which is good and bad at the same time. Because I look out the window, and all I want to do is fly. But can you? Uh, uh, can can you? Is, I mean, I'm. You know, we're all kind of probably for lots of stuck in our houses. Can you paint a picture? What's outside your window? What's What's the view like? Don't you don't need to show us, but just describe like where you are. It's a stunning part of the world, Interlaken, right? Well, I can see snowy peaks. I can see the Nissan where, you know, Kriegel breaks the records all the time. Uh -huh. um, I can see all the big mountains and lovely sunshine, puffy clouds. Oh, stop. A nice vibe breeze. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. <laughs> um, and so you work as a tandem pilot. Um, uh, I hope you treat your passengers well because I went... I, we were on holiday in February, and um, we went. I like went diving for a day, and I got the experience of being a paying punter. And I wasn't sure about it because they're like these really cool divers. Like, yeah, come on, we're going to do this. They weren't really that interested enough as people. Like, you know, how do you um, what, what kind of how do you kind of like help the, your passengers have a really good day? What makes a difference to them? Do you think apart from the flying? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think it has to be on both parts. Uh, when yeah. you see someone excited about it, you you also kind of get excited to show them uh, a little bit your passion and to show them the sky. So it depends also on the level of of excitement that that person brings, um, and we we it allows us to maximize that experience a little bit on the ground, make a few jokes, and uh, show them a little bit more and tell them. You know about the area and about the sport. Are some but people also not have to go... I like some Sorry? people. Excited. Are some people just not excited when you're driving up to the mountain? Are people genuinely uh, excited? Some people genuinely think it's like a ride in a theme park. Right. Just it's a bit sad, but if you yeah. like that, they, they just want to play that game and get on with it. It's, it doesn't yeah. mean much to it. It doesn't mean as much as it is to me or to a lot of other people. Yeah, but it's, it's just a fraction of our passengers. And you've taken your wife Juliana tandem a few times now. Is that right? Have you uh, have you had uh, some good flights with her? Yeah, quite a lot. Um, it's uh, I, I mean we've flown the first time she flew here in Switzerland. I took her to fly right in front of the Jungfrau, the monk of the Eiger. And uh, at 3,600 meters, and it was astonishing. We were soaring in front of the Jungfrau Yacht, waving at the tourists. 
I've also gone with her to the shield horn and, and flying back home, landing in our backyard. Um, and also in the Cauca Valley back home, we've flown a lot. Um, so yeah, she, she's my best passenger. And uh, Fitu, your son? Uh, my son Fito, my four-legged son, uh, he's flown a few times, but it's best only to fly him in warm weather. He gets cold very easy. So, I, so yeah, I, 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 I would wait until like the middle of summer. That's when he's most comfortable in the air. From what I've seen of Fito, he kind of enjoys being on takeoff the most uh, with, with the other dogs. <laughs> yeah, let's say he likes it human style. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, how did you find like moving to Interlaken as a Colombian? Obviously, you lived in Sussex near 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 me in in England for several years. Um, but um, yeah, how did you find like moving into Switzerland and kind of breaking into the industry? Was it easy or? Um, yeah, I mean, if if you are kind of like an experienced pilot, it's easy to make that transition onto a new site. Of course, there are a few tricks and tips that uh, people have to give you. And it's like anywhere it's in Italy, while you meet the people and while they are, while they get to know you also, like, you know, if you come new to a new, pla to a new site and no one knows you, it's, you know, you have to kind of prove yourself, uh, you know, by doing things well and, you know, messing up and uh, do, you know being like a decent guy and so on so you uh, you moved to you moved from Colombia to London when you were like a teenager with your mom and I remember you telling me that you think that anyone you know is a migrant moving in, in into the UK you you know you couldn't speak English you ended up working in a uh, a well-known uh, uh, fast food chicken restaurant. <laughs> But that <laughs> taught you that you could kind of do anything you wanted. Is that right? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you have like a kind of like a good work ethic, uh, there is no reason why not. And if you're young and kind of energetic, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, that was a nice process coming into the UK, learning some English, working at a fast food restaurant eating lots of chicken and still your favorite and, restaurant uh at, at the top yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah i think if you put your mind to it you can achieve many things yeah yeah okay cool um so i thought we might like show one of the clips um where should we start should we start with brazil or mont blanc what would you like to talk about first what was the first option brazil Flying the flag. Oh, we, can, we, we can talk about Brazil, yeah, of course. Cool. Right. Uh, I'm not an expert at this technology, so bear with me. I'm going to try and find a clip. I think this is you got you on final glide, um, just to set the scene. So I'm going to hide myself, and then you're. If you want to talk as this as this shows, feel free. Um, but you won't hear from me till I come back on the screen. Okay. Lucky you. Here we go. Hey, oh, that was a pretty special final glide. Uh, that was when Seiko first broke her, her distance record, and I think it was also declared female distance record. Uh, we were flying that day with uh, Charles, Seiko, Felix, Manuel Quintanilla. We, we at the end, we separated a little bit. I wanted to optimize uh, for the furthest distance, and Senko and Charles, they went for the declared goal uh, that she had set, which was a bit more to the left. Uh, it was a pretty special day. I think that day I flew 470 something kilometers and I had to walk three kilometers in the dark to find my car. But yeah, it was fun. And uh, can you tell us more about like your experience of um, towing there versus uh, t foot foot launch from um, Kishada? What's what's it? Because what, you just you started towing in the last what two years, and, and you're very convinced by it, right? Absolutely, totally convinced. Uh, I mean, I, I I did the Kishada thing, and it's so scary yeah. that it's real. I, I mean, you've done it as well. You went with Mark a few years back. 
and uh, it, it's just the the an how anxious you are in the morning is you waste a lot of energy just being scared about the takeoff and with the with the toys much easier it's on the it's not only is it a uh, spine back but it's also kind of the side of a shoulder so it's just set up for the wind to just push through exactly where yeah. it pushes too hard and uh, it's just scary and um yeah with the toe field it's just that initial pull that it might pull you a bit too much and so on but you have lots of people around you helping and and once your glider's flying, you just go up like crazy. Most of the days we were reaching almost a thousand meters and still going up. But if you want to break a record, you have to release before gaining a thousand meters. So we very often had to release when the glider was fully pressurized at the back. But it was still fine. You get used to it. So talk me through that because I've seen videos of um, Seiko launching in Australia where she's she pulls the wing and she's just off her feet and back straight away is it the same in in sierra um funny i mean uh, we've seen videos of the um, of the people taking off in kaiko and in parelias and tasima and it looked a lot windier than where we were like i rarely had any any situation in which i was like oh that's too much wind okay most of the time it was very manageable but actually we wanted it to be non-manageable because that's the wind that will take you far and fast but very often it was like almost zero wind and then maybe you break through the gradient and maybe you find some wind but uh, very rarely it felt like scary so you were taking off in like naught to 10 mile an hour of wind sometimes and it would still be windy yeah, up there. Okay. Yeah. so when you so okay so you weren't like taking off you, you were kind of releasing over the top of the toe you weren't kind of like way back from the toe when you release no we would actually be going forward a little bit yeah, yeah. and then fly back yeah. and the video we just saw like that just captures the beauty of xc flying for me because it's those last like two or three hours in the glassy air when you just yeah you just keep like feel like you can go on forever and your glide angle is like 30 to 1 is is that what keeps pulling you back or is it other things uh bringing me back to brazil uh, yes, uh, I mean, yeah, that feeling, uh, the training that I get out of it is impressive. Uh, flying with friends is also such a really cool, cool experience that uh, I want to do over and over again. And pushing how far I can go, and yeah, I mean, I, I still haven't done the 500 Hughes, so I, I, I wanna, I wanna get it. Didn't you didn't you leave the day that the other guys did the <laughs> Harry's just texted it was a slight tailwind somewhere. It was, didn't you leave the day you did five hundred and fifty-five or whatever it was? I mean, is that right? Yeah, I think I was at the airport or on a plane or something like that. That were oh no, I think I was at the airport with Mitch Riley, who also left that day. Uh I mean we've flown together this whole time and we saw how they were flying fast, so, so fast, and so, so far, like, wow, they're gonna smash it. And I think we may we may have been still in Brazil when that happened. Were you like checking your phone right plane. until the plane took off and the signal cut out? <laughs> Pretty much, I think it was something <laughs> like that. Ridiculous. <laughs> and then you land, like, ah. Shite. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I missed it. I missed it, should I say? Should have stayed a couple days more, and uh, yeah. But it, it was a bit funny because two days before, I remember everyone was going crazy about the forecast, and this is yeah. like 600 kilometer weather, blah, 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 and everyone, we were so excited. We took off super early, and we tried to make a, like a really good team. And that day, we only flew like 460. Okay, so that, we got like a big feature on it in issue 206, and, um, it's kind of um, Raphael Saladini talks about like um, how they've learned to sort of team fly because there's you know a core of like five Brazilian pilots who really have learned yeah. to stick together. Um, is that something that is easy to do when you're flying XC with friends? No, it's definitely not easy. It's, it's something that you have to be with a, a team. I think, in my opinion, that is not too big. 
-hmm. of pilots that have a similar kind of flying mentality to you and uh, that are on similar form, you know, like the performance of a pilot goes up and down, you know, yeah. and ideally you want to match with someone who is flying more or less at your same level. Yeah. Um, and who is willing to push as much as you and who is happy to hold back as much as you. Uh, so that's actually a very hard thing to find the right people to fly with. Okay, and maybe the Brazilians have the edge because they've got that kind of got that sorted now that they 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 know to um, to fly in a different way. So if they're high, they'll use their advantage to help the others rather than to help themselves. So they'll they'll push on and find find lift. Rafael Saladin is kind of like. Um, he, oh, Lucho is saying he's releasing a documentary about team flying. There we go. And he's seen it. Well, we've also, Gary McClurg is writing a book and um, there's a chapter by Raphael in that as well about team flying and some tips. And uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're flying 20 kilometers or 200, if you can do it with three or four other people, not only is it way more fun, but actually it's much more efficient, isn't it? Like geese, loads of, loads of migrating birds, flies, gaggles, so should we. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've done that, you. We've flown as a team with uh, you and Luke, and it's so much fun. It's generally about a kilometer. Yeah, right it's so nice. <laughs> it is. It's great. <laughs> we're generally about a kilometer ahead of me, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's just think about, um, can we move on to thinking about um, your sneaky i don't know if you took a sick day or what i mean how do you get a day off to go flying when it when you work for a tandem paragliding school you can't just pretend you're ill i mean they'll just look at the forecast and go no nah, we don't get that how do you get a day well, off? the original idea actually I, I i saw the good weather coming and my original idea i need to get a a triangle of at least a, a 250 kilometers for the exit contest to remain kind of on the podium and that was my idea and i was looking at the weather and so on and okay wednesday is the day and then i asked a friend of mine who a colleague who who was injured most of the season but he he had just recovered and he needed to work a little bit and he was happy to do tandems and he didn't look too much at the forecast thankfully so he took over my work in day that day uh yeah it's a, it it's a little bit painful Okay, so should we have a look at this? which day was it? Was it June last year? There's quite a few pilots when they flew and landed on Mont Blanc, right? Yeah, I think it was somewhere around end of June, beginning of July, I think, something okay. like that. Okay, so I'm going to like stick this up on the screen and then I'm going to hide myself again. And um, yeah, just feel free to talk. And this is you flying in on the approach to uh, Mont Blanc uh, and it shows kind of, yeah. Your your thinking and, and thought process on the way in. So just talk us talk us through it if you can, and I'll I'll disappear and I'll stop playing in a sec. Okay, so here we have the Mont Blanc right in front. I'm pointing at it. Uh, uh, um, I just need at more than three thousand, maybe even four thousand meters at that point. Uh, once we get to the Italian side, there is uh, a lovely rocky area that is facing the sun. That's where all of us just got pretty much the last climb and then up to the Mont Blanc. And, um, the cloud base that day was somewhere around 5,500, 5,600. Uh, and there were lots of people of all flying levels and in all sorts of wings. There were people on two liner, there were people on beginner wings, on tandems. Uh, my original idea was to go on my Enzo 3, but then I was a bit worried of taking off again at such altitude with my huge harness, so I decided to take my hike and fly gear. Um, after that, we we took off again and we flew to the north face of the Matterhorn. Cool. Shall I show you the next clip? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, bear with me a sec. Here we go. Right, I'm going to hide myself again. I think this, yeah, this might be you. I think you've landed here and you're just kind of looking at the view out. Let's see.
That didn't work very well, did it? No. <laughs> <laughs> let's try this one. Hang on a sec. See if this works. Right. Let's play it and see if it works. Oh, there yeah, we are. Okay, let's take the selfie together and leave. Let's take a selfie and then take Look a... at this. Cross basis. <laughs> That's what everybody does that day. And you can check out the cloud base. You can see those tiny dots in the blue sky. I mean, we're standing in the top of Europe and you still see gliders much, much higher. So how, how I mean, base was how, how, how much higher than the summit was cloud base that day? Oh, uh, I don't know, 500, 600 meters, something like that. Wow. Yeah, did you feel, <laughs> very high. Did you feel any l lack of oxygen when you were that high? Um, yeah, a little bit. I was feeling um, kind of like almost kind of stoned or something like that, you know, like, uh, yeah, you do feel it. And, you know, a, a bit short of breath, I would say. Moving yeah. around and going. I saw so many friends over there and moving around in the snow with summer shoes and so on. It was not probably the best idea. And, yeah. But, um, but yeah, yeah, it, it was... An amazing experience. We went a bunch of friends. We were like eight pilots from Interlaken, and we all made it. And a bunch of us uh, later took off and went cross country again. Where did you fly to next when you took off from Mont Blanc? Uh, we flew over to to uh, eat on the Italian side a little bit, then to Switzerland, and over the big peaks, you know, the Grand Combin and all of that wow. uh, in the south of Switzerland and. Uh, we reached the Matterhorn and we spent ages trying to get up. There was, there seemed to be a little bit kind, kind of like a convergence going on right in front and we we're trying to use it as much as possible. Uh -huh. But only one of us managed to make it to the very top of the Matterhorn. We almost have been maybe a hundred meters, 200 meters short of the top. Wow. And, you know, I had to work the next day. So I had to, you know, leg it and, land somewhere and catch a train the last train back home yeah. almost at night so that was impressive that was really quite fun do you feel quite at home in the mountains now because i mean it's totally different from flying in the Kaka valley right absolutely i think uh, when i first moved into switzerland i lived in verbier for a while and i got more and more familiar with it but i remember my first proper xc in the alps was also not in the right conditions. I was in the south of Switzerland, but with kind of almost fan wind. Mm -hmm. And I remember landing and trying to work out how people managed to fly so far in these sh shitty mountains. But then I had the chance to try in some nicer conditions with not much uh, meteor wind. And then I understood. And, and uh, I've been trying to work out the mountains more and more. Can you describe what flow and wind is for those that don't know? Well, you have the north and the south fan. That particular day, we had a, um, a little bit, tiny bit of a south fan, which means that uh, we we're flying uh, a little bit in rotor. Um, you, you feel a bit warmer air. It feels mm -hmm. also kind of um, very often more inverted and more sticky and you find leaf where you shouldn't really find it and sink where you shouldn't really find it and it's definitely not ideal to fly in these kind of conditions and also a lot of wind where it can really carry you i was going to say it's not just about it being super windy it's it's a different kind of air mass right it's like a sticky Absolutely, glue. Yeah. it just feels a bit wrong yeah it's just really unpleasant yeah okay and is that is it is it at all similar to like the sea breeze coming in at Calca Valley, which seems to happen at sort of three, four o'clock most days near Rodanier. I mean, sea breeze is just a bit breezy, and that's all. It's just wind. You definitely, it's a bit hard to get up. Uh, you get the very every now and then some punchy thermals, but uh, but that same breeze you can use the you know. If, in, on the right days, you can use it to, to take advantage of and to find a nice convergence line and fly away. Mm -hmm. It's something that perhaps is a little bit harder to find with, uh, with the fan. Yeah. 
Uh, perhaps someone like Kriegel or some top pilot from the Alps can manage, but I'm probably not at that point yet. Um, but in the Cauca Valley, you can use this uh, Pacific breeze and try and find a nice lifty kind of convergency line to to do some nice distance. So uh, the um, Cauca Valley is um, a feature in the travel guide, which is available for free for everyone now on our website, xcmag.com. And Seb's written a very, very nice kind of insider's guide to the Cauca Valley. Um, so let's come back to sea breezes in the Cauca Valley at the moment. But I want to kick off by asking you about your quite controversial statement that um, Roald and EO is not that suitable for pilots who have 50 to 100 hours. Can you say more about that? <laughs> yes, yeah, rather controversial for many people. Uh, but I don't know. I think I went through a very good, you know, it could be Colombia uh, 15 years ago or 16 years ago, but I went through a very good uh, teaching process. Uh, I was taught very well and I did the whole process really well ideally initially but i remember my instructor wouldn't take me to roldanillo at all like he was like okay first you get to the get used to the thermal conditions in el Cerro Manuevo or somewhere nicer with you know a nicer takeoff and so on and then you move on to roldanillo and i mean i tried to think of myself as a my 50 hour pilot I wouldn't be able to work out uh, when the sea breeze would be coming down, you know, where the outset. <laughs> <It's, it's really laughs> because the structure looked really good above you, and suddenly the, the the trees are it's like blowing twenty five miles an hour beneath you. So, and that can happen at two o'clock. So, I guess is that is that the main issue? Do you think with Roald and Eo and its position in the in the valley for, for lower? Yeah, air? I mean, the, the, the positioning in the valley and the, the, the fact that the sea breeze comes a bit earlier than some other places, uh, the fact that there is no official, like, super wide landing field where people can just yeah. go. Um, the fact that, well, in the takeoff that we used to have in Los Tanques, that is not used so much anymore. Uh, we used to have what you call, like, a false headwind. So yeah. the rotor comes and maybe you get a bit of thermal and and then you take off it's nice and then 20 seconds later you are hitting some super rough air and that's how actually people have you know perished like that yeah. and um and the other takeoff which we use uh, that i like a bit more is just the glide angle to get to a safe landing is it, it can be sketchy on the wrong day or with the wrong pilot or if you have like a knot or something and if you can, if if you then go to a place like Piacenza where you can be on a speed wing and still make it, and you can fly many many times on one day, and you know when 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 you are a beginner, you wanna first try the morning easy thermals or the late afternoon thermals before they put you at midday there. And um, in, in places like Piacenza and in Ser Manuevo, I think that's easier to do, just so, many flights and so on. Yeah. When you're guiding, because you do some guiding with Pal Takats, don't you? Is it, do, you, do, you do you tend to go to Pierre de Chimpier, um as a, as a base, or is there anywhere else that you use as a base? We we start in Pierre Chinche because it's a good place to warm up, to get the pilots ready, to get the pilots working the thermals nicely and takeoffs and landings. You know, pilots are coming from a very cold season in the northern, in the northern hemisphere and are probably not that good. On shape, in shape, and uh, so we start in Piacenza to get everyone going, and then once they are ready, we take them to Rolanillo. We we try to fly to Rolanillo from, from Piacenza, and then we spend some days in Rolanillo, and then we try to fly back to Piacenza from Rolanillo. And you, uh, you mentioned Appia. Can you describe Appia to us? Well, uh, Apia, I've only flown three times in Apia, uh, and that's when I was trying for the Colombian record. Uh, my impression is that the, the town of Apia is really kind of pushing for to develop this flying site. I never landed at the, you know, like the official site for landing, so I don't know it, I wouldn't be able to tell you. 
but it's a pretty cool place to start your cross-country flights in the morning and probably head to the north if the airspace is allowed because it's always an issue i don't know but uh, it's a cool place to start early um, but uh, i think it also gets the influence from the pacific eventually okay um late in the afternoon on a good day um so yeah but it's a good place it's beautiful it's a lovely town and the takeoff is nice um, and it works well cool um and um i'm just thinking yeah you, you know you you've flown in a lot of competitions you won a lot of competitions in the calca valley um and you've talked about the way you've had to kind of control your inner monkey the kind of part of you that wants to push on and take strategic risks um and i remember you talking to gavin about this but what's what's helped in you kind of learning how to control um that sort of impulsive side of yourself well it was you who introduced me to that concept for the first time um <laughs> but what have you done we all, we, all, we all kind of have it don't we but what's what sort of made the difference i know you've been working with thomas Turia. Uh, I, I think you just being aware and and kind of remember yourself that it exists like i sometimes forget that there is such a thing as a monkey and i just go and fly and the monkey takes over so i i think just being aware that it exists and uh, it, it, it's very much alive and you need to control it it's it's kind of like a mi mindfulness thing i would say uh, and it, it depends on the day there, there are days where the situation just lets my monkey be and might be a good or a bad thing but in in in, in colombia i seem to be every time a bit more controlled just simply because i feel like uh, I have nothing to prove to anyone there, you know, uh, I have the record and I won a few nice comps over there. So I feel like if I lose the comp or something happens, um, it's not the end of the world and I try to take it easy and it's a nice way to train how tactical I can be, how disciplined I can be. Yeah. But uh, it's like Ross says, the, 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 I think Ross has he, he he talks a lot about discipline but it's not about like waking up and doing 20 push-ups and then whatever and going for a run it's more about being disciplined with uh, with yourself like with your with your plan stick to your plan like okay if i wanna if today i just want to pimp uh, i should stick to it but often what makes uh, makes you break that discipline is your monkey but if you remind yourself that what you want to be is disciplined, perhaps it's, uh, it's a good way to counteract it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, controversial one. Wh which is more important for like um, pilots who are just starting to thermal and cross country, the kind of pilots who you maybe you've done a bit of guiding with? Would you say observation is more important or glider handling? I think uh, glider handling. Uh, brings up the the observation because right. if if you can handle your handle your glider and i feel it with myself like if i go with a glider i don't like or something like that i'm focusing more on the glider than on observing so i think when you when you're able to handle your glider good uh, your bandwidth is uh, you know big enough so that you can focus on observing without thinking about your wingtip or turbulence or mm -hmm. other pilots. You have one less thing to think about. And okay. of, of course, in, in a tactical sense, observation is super important. But I think um, glider handling is uh, more important in many ways. And what kind of things do you tell pilots that you've seen have helped them with their glider handling? in thermals or in other aspects? What sort of things have stuck with pilots, would you say? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I just need to kind of think about it. Um, I think the best way to teach a, a little bit the, 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 the basics of glider handling, and I have to say um, I'm not Pal Takats or Russ or anyone specialized with that issue. But for me, ground handling is a good, 
an amazing way to improve your glider handling in the future. So I, I think, uh, you know, that's one of the initial steps, but I, I and I, it's also a controversial thing to say, Hugh, but I feel that many schools, uh, they just get you through the process. They make you do a little bit of ground handling. They make you tick off the box where it says that you did a reverse launch, and then you keep going on to many other things, but you kind of forget the basics. I, I think, uh, at least in my process, my, my teacher was very pushy with the whole ground handling thing, and I'm very thankful for that because... Uh, it, it, it helped me a lot to fly safer in the future. So yeah. uh, for me, ground handling, if, you know, right now I think it's, it, it doesn't hurt to go out to the field and, you know, you're not flying and it's, if there is a nice breeze. Uh, I still do ground handling to these days. And if I have a new wing, very much, uh, very many times, uh, the first thing I do is ground handle it. That way yeah. I can find out how long the brakes are and, how it reacts uh, to, to the brakes, if it shoots too much, if it doesn't shoot enough, and yeah, many things. Yeah, I guess it depends which country you're in, because in the UK at the moment, we're encouraged to just not not ground handle, just because it's kind of like we have small hills, people might see see that we're flying, so actually ground handling is kind of out as well. But, um, but yeah, definitely something yeah. to pick up on when we get back, back there. Um, okay, cool. Um, so, I saw you um, full stalling your Zeno uh, just casually, kind of before the start gate, um, two or three years ago. You weren't dropping it into, you know, you were just dropping it in and then holding it, coming back. Let's do something physical now. Can you show us with your hands? Can you get your hands up? Go back a bit. Yeah. Can you show okay. us the proper technique? <laughs> That's it <laughs> for stalling a two liner. Okay. Simple as a three liner, right? Let's see. Let's do it. Come on. <laughs> I don't know. I just push, push, push. The tips go back. Then I don't want to let them touch at the back because that's kind of bad and they can tangle. So when the tips go back, then I let go a little bit and then catch it again. And it should kind of go like with the tips backwards. Are you, then, uh, are you watching your wing whilst you're doing this? Yeah, totally. And mm -hmm. I'm also assuming a more like um like acro style position on my harness i i try to keep my legs in instead of fully out like on the cocoon yeah to keep my center of gravity a bit more stable and are you, uh, one, of, are you one of these pilots that just goes in full stalls because like i know everyone keeps going on you should do 300 you know full stalls i do maybe an average of one and a half a year and and they stay <laughs> And I know I should do more, but I suspect I do more than like ninety percent or ninety five percent of of pilots, and it's it's nothing. So, um, yeah. What what do you do? Do you do a lot? Um, I do a lot a lot of like, uh, baby stalls. I would say I I don't think they're fully stalls because the the glider does start flying, does stop flying, and it deforms a little bit, but the. Um, does it just I don't let it go into back flight too much yeah. or anything like that. I just let it go straight away. Okay. So it's more like a parachutal kind of thing, and then the glider get, gets so wiggly and then flies off. Does that count? Can we can we tick can we tick one off for that? Is that okay? Can we tick tick <laughs> tick one off of the three hundred? <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Um, yeah. All right. A couple more questions before I let you go. Um, favorite wing ever. <sighs> Uh, oh, I have to say, I have two fav favorite wings ever. This one. one is the, okay, the, the Enzo 3. It might sound okay. biased, but I, I love that wing, yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm about to hit my third Enzo 3, so really? <laughs> I really love it, yeah. Yeah. Um, still with the Superman blue and red colors? No, no, I changed. Now I have a, a gold and blue. Okay. And um, favorite site ever? If you could only fly one site for the rest of your life, which would it be? Oh, um, oh, that's a good question. Um, so in the Alps, probably here even. Really? Not, yeah. not Colombia? Um, I, I mean, I love Colombia, don't get me wrong, Hugh, but if you yeah. give me- Epic It's getting angry right now. <laughs> if, 
if if you give me epic conditions uh, in Colombia and epic conditions in the Alps, I choose the Alps. And how do you spell Colombia? With a O, oh, <laughs> with a no. One of your buzzers. Colombia, not Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just last question. Um, I guess a lot of us have been, you know, such a big change. We're not mentioning the C word, I'm not mentioning it, but it's been a big change in the last three weeks, four weeks. Um, have you kind of like, has anything, have you, have you been left thinking about things and, and one, you know, if you come up thinking about what kind of matters to you or who matters to you, I mean, who's, who's, um, who are you going to kind of look forward to seeing when all this is over? Uh, well, just going back home and see my family back in Armenia, in Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been in touch a lot and uh, it's, it's kind of a nice time to, to keep in touch with people like we've been talking more more than uh, more than before uh, to back home so i think that's kind of nice cool and is there anything you're gonna want to do more of that that, that you've, you've reevaluated? like how do you want to spend the rest of your days and <laughs> sounds a bit grim but i mean how do you want to spend the rest of your life what's, what's what matters to you now I think, uh, you know, being close like this and looking at this guy, which is looking wonderful. And uh, I just want to keep doing more of more of everything. In fact, uh, I want to, I just got a new hike and fly wing. I want to really use it. I want to get the most out of it and, and maybe do some easy ball beeps with friends and enjoy the mountains. Uh, a few missions and uh, maybe do a bit more kite surfing and maybe get around to learning proper acro and yeah. of course uh, keeping going with my missions in brazil and so on i don't know if brazil would happen for me this year because mm -hmm. for the due to the lack of work uh, i might need to work in october i still i'm still undecided but uh, i just want to do more of everything i want to work more i want to um, and i want to enjoy life more i guess that's kind of the message yeah cool well, it's been great chatting to you. Um, I am going to just put up, remember that, the, the little clip of you flying down in, this is Interlaken, right? Um, so I'll play that just to finish off. Um, but it's been a pleasure chatting to you, Seb. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Yui. Pleasure. Uh, it's been good catching up and um, maybe see you in sunny, or well, more like rainy England. Uh, Watch it. We get the chance to visit, Watch visit you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to um, hide myself. Great talking to you, Seth. Take care. Hey, take care, you. Take care. Bye.